expiring in North They're showing up everywhere. The Tuesday 14 Board of Selectmen workshop survey results meeting to order. I have a couple of pieces of business to conduct before the board. Uh, the first is, and since we have school committee here, do we have a quorum of school committee? Um, the matter of the matter of the reappointment of um, the vacant. No, I was calling the school committee to order. Thank you. Thank you. The library. Thank you. Um, Get the library. Get the library. Too. Library here. Thank you. The. Um, my understanding is the post posting for the vacancy on the school committee was made today. Actually, I should probably use this. That's for here, right? The posting for the um, opening on school committee was made today. And my understanding is that that will close on December 11th, I believe. Uh, the question is, what's the will of the school committee in terms of having the appointment meeting that would follow? Okay, December 18th. Any any comment from the board, plus or minus? Uh, is that is that the regular the regular school committee? Yeah. It is. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, I could make it. I, I think it's yeah, I think good. it's important to kind of fill this before we get into the budget season. Yep. So yeah. I, I can right. make myself available for that. All right, good. I consider it a date. So where was it? Could you repeat the date again, 18th. Chuck? December 18th. December 18th. 18. <clears throat> I imagine at your place, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's an away game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. The okay. 18th is a... 7.30? Uh, 7. Oh, that's 2016. Okay. All right, I have a couple of statements to read, and then uh, we'll move directly to the subject at hand. Um, I have two statements this evening. Um, uh, one, the matter of an open meeting law complaint filed by um, Ms. Emily Mon. Ms. Mon filed a complaint on November 9th after the Board of Selectmen had already posted its agenda for this meeting tonight. On Friday at 2.34 p.m., the Board posted a revised agenda that included discussion of the complaint. It's important to note that while Private businesses in the Commonwealth observe Veterans Day on Friday. The legal day holiday was a Saturday. Thus, the board timely posted this agenda item for this evening more than 48 hours prior to tonight. And even if Friday were a legal holiday, the board can still properly discuss the complaint this evening. First, I personally did not learn of the complaint until Friday and therefore could not have reasonably anticipated this matter before then. Second, upon learning of this complaint, I asked for the agenda to be updated immediately to reflect this topic for this evening. And third, the discussion of the complaint is time sensitive. This board must respond to the complaint within 14 business days. If the board waited until its next meeting to review the complaint, it would only have a few days before a response would be, would be due. In my view, therefore, the board should properly discuss this topic now to ensure that it has enough time to respond properly. On the matter of the complaint itself, the complaint alleges that a quorum of the board improperly deliberated outside a posted meeting during the Finance Committee's meeting on Wednesday, October 11th, that was the financial forum, where, a, where the town's fiscal year 19 budget was being discussed, period. It is the town's policy that when a quorum of a public body anticipates attending another body's meeting, another public body's meeting, the visiting body will post in notice in case a quorum does deliberate. Since it was possible that a quorum of the board would attend the Finance Committee's meeting, town staff were directed to post notice of the meeting per this policy. However, it was not the intent of this board to deliberate during the October 11th meeting. As Monday was Columbus Day, town staff posted this notice on Tuesday morning less than the required 48 hours prior to the uh, meeting. The open meeting law specifically permits a quorum of a public body to attend a meeting of another public body without posting notice, so long as the visiting members communicate only by open participation and do not deliberate. For that specific reason, I made a statement at the beginning of the October 11th meeting 
that while the board had a quorum present, the board had not po posted notice of its meeting and would not be deliberating. The members of the board therefore sat apart from each other during the, the meeting. I sat in the first row next to no one. In addition, the Finance Committee did not provide the selectmen with any special opportunity to address them, and we were allowed to participate only at the discretion of the committee chair. Furthermore, when Barry and I did speak, we did not respond to or comment upon each other's prior comments. We also did not vote nor make any decisions regarding the town budget during that meeting. Despite this, the board recognizes that the statements made during the meeting may have crossed the line into deliberation such that a proper posting would have been required. The board apologizes for any violation that may have occurred. The board has made and continues to make a strong commitment to transparency and to compliance with open meeting law. And in a personal note, um, I don't, I don't matter, it doesn't matter to me how big a group is or how small or how new or how old, you follow the rules. And on this point, I apologize. We again pledge to ensure that all meetings of the board are posted more than 48 hours prior to a meeting and that a board member will refrain from any proper deliberation when attending a meeting which is not posted. In order to provide additional transparency, the board will create minutes for the October 11th meeting. For those interested, the meeting was also recorded and may be watched online via RCTV's um, link on YouTube. Uh, please mail, mail the town manager for the link to the meeting. Of particular note, this board is required to respond to the complaint within 14 business days. I would request a motion from this board to vote to authorize town council's office to make a timely response to the complainant. So moved. Second. Okay, I have a motion, I have a second. Is there any further discussion on the proposed motion? Is this up to town council as to what is going to be said in the response? Um, it, will be, it will be reviewed with myself and if the board is interested, I can make it available more generally. I think it's a fairly straightforward response. Yeah, I, I appreciate your concerns, Mr. Chairman. I don't believe any deliberation occurred. I do believe there was an agenda item that the FinCom had put on their own agenda uh, regarding comments from the Board of Selectmen for that evening. But that was not an agenda item that we put on. And in fact, I believe Bob declined our participation in that explicitly uh, that evening. So. Uh, from my point of view, there, there was no violation. Understand, but we have an obligation to respond to the complainant and the complaint within uh, the time prescribed. So that's my input All for right. what it's worth. Motion on the floor. Any further discussion? Yeah. Barry. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I just want to sort of make a, a, a sort of a personal apology on here before we vote. I think it was when I raised my hand in response to a comment from a member of the audience. That's what sort of triggered the... Um, what some would call a deliberation. Um, uh, to me, this is prob that was probably the 24th financial forum in a row that I've attended, either as a selectman or before that as a FinCom member. To me, it was another financial forum, this time more important, dealing with the, you know, the critical finances. Um, the other 23 in a row that I went to, I showed up and I participated. This was no different. Um, I didn't realize that we weren't posted. Um, I certainly wasn't um, deliberating with my colleagues, although I think by me raising my hand to say something, it's what triggered this. So I want to give a personal apology um, by taking up a lot of valuable time and oxygen on trying to deal with this. But, um, you know, again, I looked at it as just a way of, um, you know, people, people want to know what their selectmen say. We weren't posted. Bob, I'm going to attend every financial for forum going forward. So, you know, it takes two seconds. Let's just post it. Um, and we don't have to worry about it again but again I apologize and uh, didn't mean to deliberate with anybody just responding to a comment from an audience member thank you any further comments John I'm I'm uh, I mean I, I, I listened I just listened to your statement for the first time um, and where you you spoke for the for the board it's a little hard for me to, to vote on something that that I haven't had a chance to look at a, ahead of time so I just ask moving forward that um, you know, if you respond for the board, uh, unless I'm missing something, uh, to shoot it out to us so we can have, a, I can have a chance to prepare and look at it, uh, et cetera. As for the meeting, uh, I looked at it as an opportunity not to have to speak, so uh, there was a bit of relief on my part. Uh, 
and and, and but, but your everything else sounds uh, um, sincere and appropriate to me. Just for the just for the record, Andy, um, yeah. it's guilt by association. If one does it, we all do it. So I understand. It's just that your statement was read out representing the board, <coughs> and 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 I. I don't know about you guys, but I hadn't had a chance to take a look at it. I think the response is relatively straightforward. I understand Agreed. your point. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Well, will the response be brought back to the board since there is time for um, the board to I don't, respond? Unless there's a reason not to, for whatever other, I don't see a reason not to bring it back to the board. That's fine, then. Yeah. Any other comments? I'm clear. I didn't make the meeting. Okay. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> for once, John, you're out of trouble. Okay. <laughs> All right. All those in favor of the motion? Five zero. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for attending tonight. Uh, thank you for those watching at home on RCTV. I want to make a few opening comments regards the survey. First of all, uh, the survey was designed by the Board of Selectmen, and I want to give particular recognition to my colleague on my left. Uh, Barry did an excellent job reviewing the finished document and making sure that the questions were well crafted and on point. Um, the survey ran from August through September 5th. They included quantitative questions, how many, how much, when, where, and qualitative qu comments where users could free, free flow anything that they wished. The answers will be segregated, as you'll see here momentarily, by the cohort, by the group, um, based on what the respondent indicated for their October 16th position on the original override question. There were comments permitted, I believe, for each question. There were 13 questions total, 12 with multiple choice, plus a 13th as general comments, which unfortunately was distributed early. Tonight we'll review the results from the first 12 questions. Um, the responses have not been provided to the public in advance by design. We want you all, both here and at home, to see the presentation live, given at once by the same presenter using an interactive database. Jane Miller, Reading's business administrator and, uh, for the record, moderator from the town of Tewksbury, has done this multiple times with myself, Mr. Halsey, Mr. Berman, so she knows where the questions are likely to be, and I'll, I'll trust her judgment. For her presentation, I'm going to ask that there be no questions, that we let Jane complete the entire pass through all 12 questions without interruption. The principle being, many of the questions you have will be answered and those which aren't will be given a chance in the second segment to go through point by point for the elected boards. If um, we know this process is likely to take a couple of hours, it took us three and a half the first time we went through it. Um, again, once complete, we'll return to question each question in series to FinCom, school committee, and library trustees and the board if there are any, any other questions. Time permitting, we'll take questions from the others in the audience. For those at home or those who have a question that's not answered, please jot it down or send it to the uh, town manager at an address that we'll provide by the end of the evening. Um, again, we're reviewing the questions. I should note that there are approximately 1,700 comments that have never been seen. The comments you've seen are the responses to question 13. What you've not seen is the 1,700 comments for questions 1 through 12. Many of these comments are, are pointed. The Board of Selectmen received criticism from several, including, um, and it was not reserved to us, other uh, uh, elected groups within the town were also singled out. It will be tempting for many to go immediately to the comments, uh, and they are in unedited form, and they will be provided to the public. Um, some of the surveys were taken on paper and transcribed by, on computer by staff at the Pleasant Street Center in the library, and it's possible that innocent errors in translation excuse me, transcription were made, but otherwise no editing, no change has been made. Uh, the outcome that I desire tonight is to understand voter opinions, and that's why this survey was developed. Our intention was to use these opinions to inform our actions relative to a potential ballot question. There are those who will want to cherry pick the data they see here for their own purposes, good or bad, and I want no part of that. There are those who will suggest that some of the questions and responses here were designed to elicit negative responses, and I take exception to that suggestion. And there are those who will disregard what the survey reports and claim it's irrelevant, and I don't even know how to respond to that. The amount of time that's gone into this, its creation, 
its computation, now its outbrief, is substantial. The survey is designed to example, e examines voter opinions from the three cohorts. Some of the opinions are happy, some are angry, and some are indifferent. It's possible some of what you read will be disagreeable or objectionable, and I'm not interested in using this survey to pick sides or pick losers or winners, and I suggest those listening to avoid the same behavior. What this board wants, or I should say what I want, is understand how we get Reading, and I mean all of Reading, one Reading, to yes. How do we get to yes? How do we move forward, and what will be different this year than our approach in 2016? Before I turn the uh, floor over to Jane, I have one question for the board, which we need to answer. What is the will of the board regards distribution of tonight's questions and comments to the public? Um, I have a, a thought, which I'll pass, and uh, which is that we ought to distribute tonight's survey as soon as practical. It's essentially public the minute it's it presented. Um, I would suggest we take a pause of a day or two or even a week on the comments for two reasons. One is that it's going to take a bit of time to prepare them. But more importantly, I want the survey results to sink in. I want folks to dwell on the quantitative before they swim in the quantitative and in the, in the qualitative. Um, and that the value here is in both, but focus on the numbers before we get into the opinions. Um, I'll turn it open for other comments. Uh, Barry. Mr. Chair, I, I agree that the comments should be held back only because you know, we did release some comments earlier on, uh, uh, on one of the other questions. Um, and it seemed to create kind of a maelstrom of, um, of comments and, you know, people sort of falling within, you know, their, their swim lanes, you know, in, in, in their echo chambers. And since those comments were just sort of raw and not tied to any data, um, you know, I, I, what I'm afraid of is that people will go right to see if their comment was published as opposed to actually what did the survey tell us. So my recommendation would be, um, that we hold off on the comments, at least maybe through Thanksgiving, give the community a chance to digest what we have here, and then obviously it's public information, we let it go, but at least now people have a chance to kind of understand what the questions were, what the responses were, um, where some of the common ground is, where some of the things that we need to make up before they go right to the comments. I mean, that's what people, people are gonna do, um, and I think that what we're gonna see here tonight is vastly more important um, and, and a bigger takeaway than you know, just sort of the individual comments. I mean, we'll get those out, but I mean, this is the more important thing. And I, so I, I, I would recommend maybe after Thanksgiving to let those out. Any other opinions? Uh, um, just a point of clarification. Um, first of all, that although you and myself and Barry have viewed this, it's important to point out we didn't view it together. Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Um, <laughs> Thank so you. as to avoid any confusion about Thank open meeting laws Thank and quorums. Nor did we talk about it amongst ourselves either. Nor did we see the comments. I, I never got to them. I never no. saw them. Um, I, I think that Barry's suggestion probably has some good common sense to it. They are, as long as we're going to, everything has to be released. You know, it belongs in the public domain. But I do agree that the data analysis is probably the more valuable to us regarding proposition to an app override, how it's structured, how the message is delivered. And I, I think that there is a certain value to the comments, but they stand alone. And so the idea of giving till after Thanksgiving is something that I would be comfortable with as long as everybody in the audience and at home knows that it's not a question of withholding, it's a question of, you know, distribution in an orderly way. Yeah, I understand those comments. So it will not be discussed or released tonight? Or will? Uh, no, the comments will not be released okay. tonight. So the still proposal is to release them after Thanksgiving I, holiday. I think that would be copacetic with the uh, public records then to release it later. Okay. Yeah. Andrew? So um, I think no matter what we do. Sorry, we only have one mic. So no. uh, I think I, I'll try to speak up or project. <laughs> I think that no matter what we do, uh, some people, you know, people are. Um, social beings and we go to our comment and we post to Facebook and some things are some things may get blown out of proportion um, I think that's going to happen no matter what we do but um, if, if, the, if the rest of the board would like to have the just the simple answers to the questions put out first 
encourage people to digest that um, and then put out the comments, um, that, that's, that's fine. Afterwards, that's, right. that's fine with me. We don't need a vote. I just wanted to sample the will of the board. Okay. With that, I'll turn the floor over to Jane. Right. Jane? Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. It's nice to see you this evening. I'm Jane Miller. Um, I'm going to take you through some of the things that um, we're good. Um, through uh, some of the things that Mr. Arena just said, and um, we'll proceed. I have the uh, presentation here on some slides. I also have the survey live um, on the website, and we will, can go to that later on. I do, it is easy to get really bogged down in some of these questions, so we're going to try and get through all of them first, then we'll come back uh, for your questions. Um, it, it might go a little faster that way. Um, so in June 2017, the selectmen began working on drafting language for a survey to better understand residents' interests and concerns regarding Proposition 2 and a half, um, the override that failed in October 2016. The language was finalized and town hall staff administered the survey. The survey was offered online through SurveyMonkey. Paper copies were distributed to the public at town hall, the Pleasant Street Center, and the library. Surveys that were returned were manually entered into the online survey so as to capture responses within the data sets. Um, I personally entered them. Um, and I still have all of them, actually, in my office. The survey opened online on August 1st and closed at 7 p.m. on September 5. 2,488 responses were collected through three modalities. 1,780 were collected through a website link, which was the most shared link. 627 were through social media link posted on Facebook and Twitter, and 81 manually entered surveys, as I mentioned. Um, previously, we had comments from question 13 released, as was mentioned, but those comments represented less than half of the total comments, which were 2,787, which you can kind of see up here. Um, we, had question, we had comments from seven questions. Question two had 79 comments, question three had 313, and so forth. Um, they'll be released later, and they'll be binned by how people voted, so you can see how yes voters comment and how no voters comment, and so on. While this is not a statistically significant survey, we did limit responses on IP addresses. With 2,488 responses, this is equivalent to 13% of registered voters using the figure from 2017 annual town meeting. Importantly, in the October 2016 override election, 6,892 ballots were cast, representing 37% of registered voters at the time. As such, we cannot assume global results on the clear basis of responses, as the response is not representative of all the voters. However, we can look within each response group, each cohort, as Mr. Arena mentioned, for trends that inform why voters made the choices that they did. So, these are uh, just a little bit of fun stuff here. The average time to complete the survey was four minutes and 52 seconds. Um, 84% full completion rate on all surveys, meaning every single question was answered. There are 14 questions total. One was the last one if folks wanted to give us their name or address. Um, and then this is the breakdown of the votes. So here's question one. How did you vote? 41% of the respondents said they voted yes in the election. 39% voted no. I know it's hard to see here. And then 20% reported they did not vote. So we had 503 people who participated in the survey that did not vote in the election. The takeaway, what's important to remember is these numbers do not reflect the same ratio of the October 2016 election. No voters are vastly underrepresented in this turnout. As a recap, there were 4,097 residents who voted no on the override ballot and 2,795 that voted yes. Um, it may be said that the equivalent of 36% of yes voters participated in the survey and 24% of no voters participated. These are just fun little things I forgot I put in. Um, <laughs> question two. So this was for yes voters. If you remember, if you took the survey online, if you answered yes, it put you into this question automatically. So if, what were the drivers of yes votes? And the next page is a chart. It's hard to read, so we're just going to stay right here. Um, the two biggest drivers that stand out are historical and future cuts to schools. The school-related issues were the primary drivers for yes voters. There's plenty of seats in the front if you want to see a little bit better. Um, and uh, let's see here. 
keeping up service levels to protect property values was third, closely followed by presentations by town and school officials convinced folks that they needed to vote yes or they wanted to vote yes. So those are the primary drivers, but schools, historical and future cuts stand head and shoulders above the rest. And these are the percentages. Uh, let's see here, 70% historical, 81% future cuts. Question three, he voted no. He said, please tell us three reasons why. These were close, much closer together. 61% said the override request was too big, just too large. 50, 52%, so over here in the green, said the town or the municipal side budget did not justify the need for an override and explain where funds would be used, closely followed by the same thing for the school department. 43% said schools didn't make the case. These voters did not trust the messages they heard about how an override would be spent. We'll dig in more on this topic later, but this is where we start to see the beginning of the trust gap, something I call the trust gap. It's important to note, um, of 313 open response comments on this question, which had a pretty high uh, percentage of respondents sharing their thoughts, common themes included excessive spending, taxation, the library debt exclusion, and an expectation that the town, including the schools, needs to stay within a budget. If I can just take a moment and go back briefly to question two, I apologize. I just wanted to review some of the comments here in broad strokes. Reviewing the 79 open response comments, about 10 wrote that they actually voted no in the election, indicating that a few did not understand the question, choosing yes because they voted in the election, not because it's how they voted. Um, the impact on the results is de minimis but I'm sure people will notice later when they read the comments. Additionally, many of the comments are actually not really supportive of the override in spite of their yes vote. Um, again, tenors of mistrust, begrudgingly voting yes, yes, mixed messaging, and more. And again, here we start to see that trust gap. So moving back, we've already covered question three. Question four. If you did not vote, please select all that apply. The takeaway here, getting to the polls and an information gap, but the comments also reveal clues. 43% of the respondents state that they intended to vote but couldn't get to the polls. Later on, we'll see that getting a ride to the polls isn't gonna change how anybody votes. So that's interesting. 30% or 88 of the respondents state they didn't feel informed enough about the issues and 27% said they didn't realize the election was even happening. However, looking at the comments, we received 101 on this question, 40% actually stated that they did in fact vote. So this selection was an erroneous choice for those individuals. Of more interest, others stated they didn't live in Reading at the time, but they wanted to weigh in on an override issue as offered in the survey. Ultimately, it was very smart to include a comment section here as the answers offered weren't necessarily the ones that best fit the respondents in this case. Question five. This is when we start to get a little bit more interesting. Um, what, what would it take to get to yes, the factors that matter? As you can see on the chart, we've been them. I don't know if you, this is the people that voted yes in this section here. These are the folks that voted no, and these are the folks that did not vote. And this is how we break it down. So respondents here, the takeaway, let's move to the chart. Folks are really looking for clarity, communication, and the amount. That's what's resonating across all of the groups. Resident, uh, respondents are telling the town that where the funds are going is critical in gaining any support for a future override, and that they would only support this, it only supported if the selectmen and the school committee convinced residents that they have cut their funds or their budgets appropriately. So 58%, which is here, said they would vote yes if there was more clarity. This is the second place vote for both the yes and the no respondents. It was top for folks who didn't vote, but it got the most results with 992. 43% said they would vote yes if the selectmen in the school committee convinced them they've cut costs as much as possible. This was the top answer for no voters and the third answer for yes voters. 41% and this is really interesting, I think, 41% stated they would vote yes if they knew such a request was being made, just to know that there was an override, they'd vote yes. 
However, and I think this is really key, only 2% of no voters, almost 3% of no voters, agree with that sentiment. So instead, a smaller override request is the third place answer for no voters and may be a way to gain some support for a future override, excuse me, if other conditions are met. Because we're looking for consensus. Question six. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting I have all these comments about the comments. Bear with me. Of the 493 comments on this question, many flat out state they would not support an override for any reason or for any amount, period. Most of the rest of the comments are also negative and display concerns with honesty and trust of the school committee, the superintendent, the town manager, and the selectmen. Many would divided particularly along those lines. There is a perception of a rift between town departments, such as the DPW, police, fire, and public services, and the school department, despite the healthy and positive working relationships among town employees, many who are in the audience tonight. Reiterating the narrative that this is one Reading and one town and that all departments matter in order to deliver services necessary to the public will be an important part of messaging in the future. Question six, where do you get your information? Where do we find out more information about what's going on in our local activities? This one I thought was fascinating as a former recovering newspaper editor. Uh, Across the board, and I think this is fascinating, and I'll go back to this because we have a little thing here, but across the board, conversations with neighbors was the number one answer for every single group, and that is this, where's my mouse? Here we go. It's this bar right here, the last one, this brown, this tan. It's the number one answer. We told everybody they could check all that apply, and conversations with neighbors was resonated across every single group. So what else do we know? See, I'm not even going by my notes. Um, the yes voters, looking at the yes voters, their second source of information was social media, and their third were online news blogs, so like the Reading Patch. For no voters, their number one was conversations with neighbors. Their second was news blogs. Their third was print media, such as the Chronicle. And the fourth, which was a really close fourth, was the town website. They're very close. Over here for a did not vote, similar to the yes voters, again, conversations with neighbors, then your news blogs, and then social media is third for these folks. What this tells us is that, is that most people, quite naturally, are engaging in confirmation bias. Talking to friends and neighbors is the predominant source of news because they are already largely in agreement Generally speaking, parents of school-age children talk to other parents of school-age children on soccer fields, um, at school pickup, at the park, wherever it is. Um, senior citizens on fixed incomes tend to talk to other seniors at senior centers, cafes, the grocery store, wherever they encounter their neighbors and their friends. Social media, the second choice among yes, excuse me, yes voters and third for those that did not vote is in no small part an extension of conversations with neighbors. In fact, with this model, some may never hear or read an opposing viewpoint. It also shows what an important role the media plays in the dissemination of facts across multiple channels, print, social, digital, and cable. Perhaps the most important is the effort that will be required by, required by selectmen, school committee members, and others to reach out to individuals with differing opinions, meet them where they are, and listen to their concerns. This survey was a strong step in that direction. And this is just the chart that shows the data. Question seven, tax bills. How does Reading measure up to our peer communities? So this one's, this one's a little funky. Uh, right here, the, the orange is that people feel their tax bills are about the same. These are higher, green and blue are higher, and light blue and rust are lower. And then you have this purple right on the end means I have no idea. So um, what's interesting here is that this question really is all about perception. On average, yes voters perceive Reading taxes to be lower than no voters and did not vote. Your yes voters at the top, they tend to be bulking up here. 
your no voters a little bit higher, and same with your did not vote, okay? That said, a fair number of respondents, 348, had no idea how Reading compares. In general, few respondents believe the town has lower than peer averages. For the record, now that the library construction debt is included in tax bills, Reading is on par with peer communities. If we look strictly, so this is kind of a fun thing to do. If we go to the survey and we look strictly at um, respondents who, this is going to take a second while it, while it munges, um, respondents who felt they had a high tax bill, okay, so folks that are, actually let's just look at this. We're going to look at this rule right here. And we're only looking at people who thought the tax bill was $1,000 or higher than peer averages. Okay? So if we look down at question eight, which we'll get to in a moment. I want you to remember these numbers, 63% would vote no for any reason or any amount. And 41% uh, would vote yes for any amount. So just keep that in mind as we move on to the next question because it changes. Basically what we're seeing is if you believe your taxes are high, that affects exactly how you will vote on the override. and It shows up here in the data. So back to question seven. Question eight, if you live in the average $500,000 renting home, you would vote yes on the April override if. So again, we're binned here by yes, no votes, and did not vote. And what's interesting is the distribu distribution is almost exactly the opposite. Uh, the takeaway, the data shows there's actually movement here for both yes and no voters. More than half of yes voters wouldn't support as high an override as last year. That's these folks right here, okay? Slightly less than half of no voters would consider supporting an override. That's these folks right here. This is 750 or less. This is $500 or less. This is $250 or less. And this is I would not vote yes for any amount. And just to point out, these are yes voters. These people say they won't vote yes again. Over here, it's almost the exact opposite. So this is getting to yes, the money factor. Remembering that the no votes are significantly underrepresented in this survey, it remains interesting to note that only slightly less than half indicate they might support an override. Unsurprisingly, the converse, more than half said that they would not vote yes for any amount. These are the entrenched no voters. Nearly half of the yes voters that participated in this survey said they would support an override even if the amount were greater than $1,000 annually. These are your entrenched yes voters. The remaining folks in the middle looking at override amounts from 250 uh, and under to 750, this is the zone of folks willing to change their minds and leaders will want to spend time talking to them. And just to look back at the chart, again, these are the folks you don't want to lose these if you want to pass an override, and you want to try and gain some of these. And finding that, that amount sweet spot is part of the solution, but certainly not the only thing that we're seeing here in the survey. Our did not voters are a little bit more evenly distributed here. Question <clears throat> nine is, what's your use of Reading Public Schools? Respondents across the board overwhelmingly are either current parents of Reading Public School students or parents of former students. These, the respondents to this survey are very familiar with our schools. Here are yes voters. Let's see here. That's really hard to read, huh? Currently attending, we have 1,088 students. Um, these are among all respondents that have children currently in Reading Public Schools. A second runner-up was 493 for those who had children recently attend, or attend but not currently. Together, they far exceed the other three responses. For no voters, responses were nearly symmetrical for having current and former, and I'll show you that on the chart. This is the current 
and these are the former students. So it's nearly symmetrical for no voters, whereas yes voters predominantly way above have students currently in public schools, and so did the did not vote cohort. We therefore understand, however, that no voters that participated understand the school system and the role education plays in the community. That said, having children that currently attend RPS was higher um, across all, 67% for yes voters, 47% that did not vote, and 38% of no voters. When 38% of no voters have children enrolled in Reading Public Schools, we can see that trust gap begin to emerge. I think sometimes there's a perception that no voters didn't have kids in school, and that's absolutely not the case. The next question we ask is, how, what's your relationship? How do you use municipal side services? And we, allow, we ask people to check everything. This is, a great, this is a great question. What we see here is tremendous congruity among the responses for the library, the Recreation Department, and the Department of Public Works, the top three answers for everyone. The only difference is, for no voters, the, um, the Recreation Department was slightly less than the Department of Public Works, but for everybody else, Recreation was actually a little bit higher. Um, overwhelming response was the library. Everybody uses the library. Um, this question received 152 comments, 52 from yes voters, 85 from no voters, and 15 from those that did not vote. Despite derision in the comments throughout the entire survey against the library project and resulting debt, it is strongly the most used department in the community based on these responses, receiving 1,818 votes on this question. While we can talk about the divisibility of certain public goods and services, generally everyone benefits from most of these services one way or another. The extent to which they acknowledge or understand it is tells us something interesting about the mindset of the voter. Comments from the yes and the do not did not vote respondents were generally matter of fact. I use this department, I use that department, I, you know, this, that, it's very straightforward. The no voters were, however, far more likely to offer a comment, carried a more negative tone in their comments, pointing once again to that trust gap. Library, recreation, and public works. So let's talk a little bit about some demographic data. Question 11 asks about the age of our respondents. The takeaway here is while no voters are all ages, they tend to be older than yes voters and did not vote respondents, but not much older. And we see that here in our, we see that here in our statistics. So you look, and it may be hard for you to tell, this is category one, two, three, four, and so on. And the way we look at what is the minimum respondent, every category had a two. So nobody below 18 filled out this survey. But somebody in this, in this category, 18 to 25, filled it out in each, in each bracket. And the maximum was eight. So there's somebody in every age category on here, except for under 18. The median vote, the median for um, yes voters and did not vote was four. So you're in here in the 30 to 45 category. Where's my mouse? Right there and your did not vote, the median was five. But then we look at the mean, so it's 4.6 and 4.56 for your did not vote, and here it's 5.4, but with a standard deviation of 1.31. So for all of you statistics nerds out there like me, um, and boy, I'm rusty, let me tell you, um, <laughs> what we see here is that there was greater age diversity among the no voters. The spread was, was larger in no voters. You were more clustered in age, any a little bit younger than your yes voters and your did not vote. For statistical purposes, how long have you lived in Reading? So this isn't terribly surprising considering the age issue we just mentioned. Uh, the takeaway, no voters tend to be residents of Reading longer than yes and did not vote respondents. Yes voters were clustered in the 10 to 20 age group, which is this light blue, and then the three to six year group right here. Okay, your no voters, um, no voters had 35% in the 30 plus year, which is this purple on the end, 26% in the 10 to 20 years, and 23% in 20 to 30 years. So they're really clustered right here. Your did not voters had 30% of their respondents in 10 to 20, but then relatively evenly distributed among the rest of the classes. 
And what you see here is that there is less diversity or less of a spread on your standard deviation for your no voters. So they're clustered in the higher, the higher uh, levels. And you can see that here. Question 13 was the comments. This is how many comments were received and if they were released previously and there were 1,022 of them, 440 were yes respondents, 457 were no respondents, and 125 were did, had not voted. Um, the takeaway here is that nearly half of all the survey respondents left a general comment. While it represents less than half of all the comments th received throughout the survey, the trust gap is evident through these comments. I've read all of them. Um, but they also include accolades for elected and appointed officials all across the various town departments and boards, as well as constructive criticism across the board in all classes. And I think there's a lot of really good information in the comments. There's also some unvarnished comments in the comments, so you know, you gotta read it, you gotta read it that way. So in conclu some, some conclusions. Local leaders have an opportunity to address this trust gap through improved communication across and among the boards and residents of all ages. Getting out into the community and listening to what voters have to say matters not just in garnering support for an override, but also for formulating the decision to go forward. Voters want clarity about how override funds will be spent. Here is evidence of that trust gap. Over and over, residents reiterate throughout this survey that they need more clarity about how override funds would be distributed, what they will get for their tax dollars. This is easier to see in debt exclusion, such as the library project. Work here must include programs, concise answers, manpower, whatever it is, the desire for clarity cuts across all demographics. Voters need to be convinced that town boards have trimmed their budget. This is a communication and perception issue. It's the trust gap again. Just as residents need clarity as to where new funds will be spent, they want to know that their current contributions are not wasted. Continuing to work on transparency, as the boards already do, clear communication on current and legacy budgets will help build trust around this gap. Based on the data, residents may support an override somewhere around $500 per annum. Considering that about half of no voters that participated said they might support an override, there is a possibility that should the trust gap be bridged and the override request lower on a per annum basis than the October 2016 request, an override of somewhere around $500 may find support. Uh, as a reference point, the October 2016 request was closer to $900 to $1,000 per annum depending on your mid-level valuation. Finally, about half of all respondents indicated they might change their vote in either direction. This applies to both yes and no voters, requiring once again the bridging of that trust gap with transparency and open communication. With a strong 37% voter turnout in October 2016 and a 60-40 rejection of the override, any success will require not only increasing voter turnout, but also changing no votes to yes and retaining your yes votes. The opportunities for leaders to reach out to voters, especially those outside their typical peer groups, abound over the next few months of the budget process. This concludes my remarks. Thank you, Jane. I just, just kudos. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jane. That was outstanding. Um, I'll open the floor to elected bodies who wish to ask a clarifying question, any of the questions. Um, anyone on the board? Andrew. Yeah, I, 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 a question and a, and a comment. You, you said a number of times that the no voters were underrepresented, but I think as you presented the data, um, that's, that's not really an accurate statement. You, you, were, you were sampling from three different populations, and you, you, you got a pretty good sample from, from each of those three different populations. And so when they were divided up 20%, 40%, 30%, getting more, for example, no voters to answer the questionnaires might have given you a somewhat more accurate distribution among the no voters. But from a statistical standpoint, they weren't really underrepresented because you weren't adding all three groups together. You, you were uh, looking at them as standalone groups. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, yeah we, we looked at them as standalone groups intentionally because the disparity was underrepresented relative to the October 2016 vote. So it, that's the underrepresentation that I'm referencing. But there, I think there is enough information there that you can look at the cohort and get a, an understanding of where that group is thinking. Yeah. Is that? Yeah, I mean, whenever you, whenever you go out and sample a population, uh, if you get 40% of that population, you're going to get a, a decent idea of where that population, sure. it, to, what, what characteristics describe that population. If you get 60% uh, return, you get a little more accurate feel for what characteristics describe that population. So I think you did a great job here in separating the three out um, because it, it somewhat mitigated that uh, disparity between yes and no vote. Yeah. Okay. And and the question that I had was, um, <clears throat> given that some of the comments indicated that people might have identified themselves in the wrong group, mm -hmm. um, is it is it possible that to, based on their answer to a or their comments to a question, could you regroup <coughs> that voter? And would it really make any difference? So in most, sorry, that was loud. Um, in most cases, it's de minimis. So it, it wouldn't change the, you know, the bottom line effect of what's happening in that group. But it's imp important to note, because when we release the comments, people will note that. And they'll see, well, this person voted no, this person voted yes. And I wanted to be clear that we looked at that. And we, we, we decided that was a de minimis. So, um, but it's important to know, because we are interested in transparency. Good. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Well, first of all, Jane, this was tremendous. Um, you really did a great job in sort of parsing it out and really breaking it down and showing us really the really where the hearts and minds are, I think, of, of the Reading voters. And I also want to compliment the Reading voters who took four and a half minutes out of their life to really <laughs> tell us what they think. That's, uh, you know, if we can just make sure that every time it was only going to take four and a half minutes, I think we get a lot more participation in government. But th I think there's a lot of good news here. First of all, um, the, the, the lion's share of people's minds are not made up, right? Mm -hmm. You have people who voted yes who are going to vote yes no matter what, and you have people who voted no, no matter what you say and do, are still going to vote no. From my calculation, it looks like that's about 70 or 75 percent of the people who, um, in the middle who, who, who can be convinced. Um, that's number one. Number two, the survey brought out really why I think we all intuitively understood. It was too big. We didn't really make the case about where it was going to go. We might not have made the case of um, what would happen if. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we didn't make the case of where we, um, of, of the cuts that we've already made. Um, so that's an opportunity for all of us to, to kind of go back and really just and, and make that case stronger. But the, the takeaway, one of the bigger takeaways for me, I think was on question six. I think it was six. Okay. Um, where do you get your information from? Um, oh, I love that question. So I, I love that question, too. Um, oh, I'm going to go up here. And uh, I, I don't think the Chronicle likes it all that much. Um, but, you know. <laughs> I used to I, be a print newspaper editor. I, 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 I get the Chronicle. So I think your comment was about kind of that the way people are getting their information is that they're getting information from their own echo chambers, right? Yeah. They're, they're talking to people who agree with them. Yeah. Um, and. That's a job, I think, that as the leadership of the town, we need to really get in there and try to change. And the thing to me was the, if you look at, I can't So this is, this is that question. Just, I'm sorry to interrupt. This yep. is question six. This is on the live survey. And I'm just zooming in here so you can see a little bit more. This is exactly what you're talking about right now. But, for the, but the smallest number appears to be... Um, Attending a community listening session. A listening session, but also conversations with town and school employees or elected officials. Mm -hmm. That's like one of the lowest ones across all boards. Yeah. So, so this hot pink. Right. <laughs> so what it means is, is that you know we're not out there talking to the voters. We, I, I know we didn't do it last time as, as much as we could have. Um, we have five months now to go out there and change that perception. So really, I mean, as selectmen, School committee people, library trustees, FinCom folks, um, that's the town leadership. Those are the folks that need to get out there and talk to people that you don't know. And, yeah. and so I think that's kind of, you know, that, that's, that's a big to-do list now for me, which is talk about this to everybody who'll listen and those who won't. Yeah. Um, and 
And that's the role of the leadership, I think, because we need to get that, forgive me, is it pink, is it magenta, it's, is it purple? It's a, it's a pink. It's a pink. It's a bright color. pink, yeah. Call that red. Maybe, maybe, yeah, it looks it's, red. It's, we need to get that bar up. Yeah. All right, if we're gonna, if we're gonna move the needle, in my opinion. So that's my takeaways. Raising the bar, okay. Um, I take issue a little bit, Barry, with what you said. I, thinking back to last year, I think we were um, comfortable that we had s described it well enough. In retrospect, maybe not, but at the time, thought we had described the need well enough. This clearly says not so much, not so fast. I think there was. Remember the dialogue last year. The, the um, initial discussion started at a nine million dollar override. We settled on seven and a half. Boy, were we off. And that's really the takeaway is I think you've really got to test that number much harder than we did. And I think your third point is right on the money, which is um, we talked about having a, um, a plan if it passed and a plan if it failed. And I think you, you generally need a plan if it failed to let the community know what the consequence is if you take the left fork versus the right fork. And I'm not sure we did enough in that vein either. Well, this year we will because we have a budget and then we have a budget if an override passes. And that's a clear. It's much clearer. Yep. And you know, people can be able to see, okay, we get this and not that. Right. That's just by the way, the timing and the structure right. compared to last time. Dan, comments? Uh, still digesting it. John? Well, I, you know, I don't, there's no point in, re in being redundant. You guys have pointed out what's, what's evident. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's amount, it's how you spend it, yeah. and are you going to do what you say you're going to do? Mm. Because there was a trust issue that is not exactly quantifiable up there, but if you read between the lines, it's pronounced. And you've got to establish or reestablish that trust level based on the information that you deliver, and that information has to be concise. People have an interest in, I, this is what I'm seeing here anyway, um, they have an interest in the value proposition. And I think that's yep. not surprising. Um, if somebody came to this town and bought a, bought a home in the last five years, particularly maybe 10, um, they felt like they were getting a value and they were willing to pay up for that value. Um, and now they're saying the same thing, I'll pay up, but give me what I, you know, give me a value and tell me how you're gonna spend my money. That to me, I'm, that's what I'm seeing in, in these numbers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is actually an omission that we probably should have caught on this uh, survey. There are two very vital services that everyone in this town uses that were not listed in that group, and that's police and fire and emergency response. Uh, no, John, John uh, just it's included in public safety. Public, public safety. safety. Public I safety. Did. Oh, it was? Okay. Yep. I, I can take you to it. Well, it's in micro dot, so I'm not surprised you can't oh. see it. <laughs> Where was it? It's a. Uh, Everybody was right here. said they were using that. Is that yeah, right? so here I will, was, I will scroll okay. in for you. That was the highest bar in the across bar. the board. No, public safety is orange. It's this color here is oh, public okay. safety. So this is your library, okay? Not this. Not this is a human and elder services. Is this there. is the library, public safety, public works, which includes paving, tree service, water, et cetera, uh, recreation, veteran services down here. That's not a surprising response. Uh, it's a very specific uh, department. The town clerk's office and other, and that was please specify and we received, oh, this is question 10. 152 comments from Sorry, other. I missed that. Yeah, we're going to have to uh, articulate very strongly the needs in the in the public yeah. safety area. We we talked about this on a program well, we recorded together today. To to follow up on that, yeah. um, if I might, it's interesting. Everybody notes public safety. It's right. not their top one. Right. It's not their bottom one. And I think one of the reasons that everybody realizes that they use it, but it's not a it's it's not high is it's good, yeah. you know? I mean, when you know you dial 911 and either a police officer or an EMT or a firefighter shows up and you can count on that, you tend to take it for granted. And, you know, fortunately in this town, um, public safety is, I think, delivered in an exemplary way. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, one of, we've talked about this before, 
a very large concern is how long they can hold that together, right. frankly. When you really dig, when you look under the surface of um, staffing yeah. um, and expanded needs the, as a result of both economic development and housing development, it's just a big question as to how long that's going to hold itself together. I mean, we have had literally a level funding of public safety uh, for the last 50 years in terms of positions, not, not in terms of money, but number of staffing. Account, staffing. Feet on the street. And, and in the meantime, Reading has grown in population some 20 percent. Uh, the composition of Reading is changing. There are far more multifamily uh, dwellings, or clusters of 55 plus dwellings. Uh, all those generate emergency calls. Uh, some generate police calls in, in certain configurations. Uh, and that, that is starting to catch up with us and straining our ability uh, to handle more than a single incident, either be it a fire uh, or a police call in this town. And I don't think we've articulated that well, nearly enough. And that, that police study that we were presented with on the 10th of October was very eye-opening. It was very eye-opening. Right. You know, we resorted the information um, of our peer communities and isolated those five communities that touch our borders. Mm -hmm. Yes. We're last. We're last in the amount of firefighters and, or not firefighters, but police officers mm -hmm. per thousand. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty interesting, yeah. actually. Yeah. I mean, a little frightening, to be honest with you. And what's scary uh, is some of the communities we would rely on for mutual aid are as strained as we are. Okay. So we're, we have to. And that's it. really true on the, on the fire side. Let's, um, let's open it up to the oh, other okay. elected committees. Um, why don't we go to school committee first? I can't tell everyone That's who's on here. Elaine's had her hand Elaine. up the longest, I think. I don't think there's a mic, so just... Uh, Pardon me? Um, I have a question. Um, were, any, were any surveys discarded for any reason? Need a mic for the, uh, Not in this result, no. All of, the, all, of the hand, how, all of the handwritten ones that were turned in, um, they, we took, we closed the survey on a certain day and then they came, some of them came over by, um, inner office mail and I have every one of them. I understand if any no. were. We can sort the data actually by people who didn't finish the survey and we can, we can parse it out, but again, it's relatively de minimis, doesn't really change the results. Um, so there were, um, 200, uh, 2,488 respondents and you said initially that the, the survey was not that's roughly fair. Yeah, I'm not without doing um, the math. So, a, a question on the, the, I'm concerned about drawing certain information from, um, from the data. And I think we have to be careful about looking at this because we're looking at data from a very specific set of respondents to the survey. Okay. So we can only draw conclusions based on the, the respondents in the survey. Right. So I, I'm a little concerned that one of the conclusions is that we're basing this data uh, and we're saying that we're going to project that as to the behavior of the residents. But I think when we look at data, this data, um, we can say that the respondents to the survey would support um, an override somewhere about $500 per, per annum, and that was a bigger range than that <coughs> data. It was. I, I'm just a little concerned because the overall response rate of the survey at 17% stated it's not statistically significant, but how are we drawing a, uh, re a inference to how residents will behave, how the, how the 17,000 voting residents will behave? I think we have to just be careful about that. And oh, I agree with you that this is, that the conclusion is really based on the data, the respondents of the survey would support something in the neighbor of. So, the yeah, so your, your issue is with the word residents versus respondents well, of the I, survey. And I think you picked a, put a number there when really the data shows a range. And I, I'm, I'm concerned about that because we, we have to be careful about how we start putting numbers out there and without any, any basis in where we need to go and the, the budget, we need to do the budget process. All the more need to go through the budget process, we need to go through what, if we are going to ask for an override, what would that override number be? And we are sort of supposing a number here and saying that that's what we think residents will support. And I, I'm just, I, I'm not comfortable with 
making that um, connection. Yeah. I think that's fair. Um, I think that uh, it could say it could better say instead of residents respondents. Um, and yes, there is a range, and the range is lower than 500. It's not higher typically when you look at the no voters. So, and they're the ones you really need to convince. Um, so yes, you do, the boards need to go through their budget process, absolutely, and I used to be a school committee member and I understand that very well. But you also have a tolerance level in your, st in your, in your population or based on the respondents to your data, Depends your survey. Which voters, and I hear you, the 250 to 750 range that we saw on the respondents to the survey, you voted no. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have a group there that, that has a certain tolerance, but then you have the yes voters who responded to this survey, and that tells you something about what that t their yeah. tolerance is. And we need to reach out and speak to both and all of the people in, in our community, um, no, no matter which of the three categories they may be in. 100%. So. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Thank you. I'll call on Linda to share. I think she was next. <laughs> Linda, can you speak into a microphone so we can there's hear there's no microphone. No, I can project very well. Uh, you know, those are for our CTV. So, but I'll repeat no. the question. Okay. Thank you very much for this analysis. I thought it was really helpful. Um, one of my reactions is that we have to be very careful not to jump to simple conclusions, and I'll use one example is that um, we weren't the main authorities that people referred to for their information. And one conclusion we could draw is that we weren't out there. But another conclusion might be that the way we were out there wasn't a way that other people were comfortable with. And so one thing that I heard loud and clear uh, was that people are more comfortable in smaller groups. And a lot of, some of what we do is in bigger groups and on TV. And um, it's harder to speak. If you could hear my heart, you'd know how hard it is to speak when the cameras are rolling and all these people are here. But when you're in smaller groups, that might be one sort of alternative response to the, the data that we got, that maybe people would feel more comfortable in a home with a smaller group of people with someone that they could ask their questions to and not be judged for their questions. So just sort of a creative parsing of the responses that we got. Um, and the other question that I had was, I, I feel deeply the trust gap that you've mentioned and, and that you pulled from the data. And I'm wondering if you found correlations between that trust gap and where people are getting their information. And you might have said that, but I'm wondering if there's a correlation, and here's my bias, mm -hmm. from to there's a lot of different sources online, social media, where the information comes from people other than those who are, well, it comes from lots of different sources, and a lot of people have a lot of opinions on social media. And I'm wondering about correlations with those origins of information. So I think that's, um, <laughs> just, I don't think it's the right to, did everybody hear her question? Did everybody hear that? That she's yeah. interested in correlations between where people get their information and uh, the trust gap. And um, I'm happy to go back and kind of dig a little bit more to look at that because I can play with the filters a little bit. We have some filters. If you look at the screen, I'll show you. Um, and I don't want to do it right now because I want to make sure I get it right before I present it publicly. Um, but we can filter on any question. And so how do we quantify the trust gap, which I think Mr. Halsey very accurately stated isn't discrete in the data, it's more felt between the lines and I think it resonates for most of the people in the room um, and we understand that. So I can take it back and present it in a couple of different ways to you and we'll present that in the final document if that's acceptable. Because I think it's a really good point. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I think it's sort of dangerous. I'm particularly worried about the question about that where people voted on a dollar number per year with no context to it. Because I think what we saw in question five was a lot more people said, I would be willing to vote for an override 
if you convince me when there's no dollar number tied to it, but then when you take it, just sort of give me a random dollar number, people are always gonna choose a lower number. It's like, how much do you feel like paying? I feel like paying 250. And I think what we really see, you have to take those two together along with the misinformation on where our taxes actually are. Yes. And we really have to get out there and tell people the real story. Because I have a feeling that $500 number would change if you said, okay, for 500, we only cut four cops and four firemen. For 750, you get to keep two firemen. For 1,000, you get to keep them all. That might change the answer. That number, out of the blue, I almost completely disagree. I mean, it's, it's nice to know sort of what numbers people are kind of thinking of, but this is really just saying us. We need to make the case and let people know. By the way, your taxes are not high. By the way, for 500 bucks, we, st we cut these things. And that will change that $500 number. So just, to just look at it and say, if people want to pay only about $500, that only applies with no context. All right, we're going to move on. And I'll feel it's on. <laughs> Feeling it's, oh, it's on now. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to, we're going to do the Merv Griffin show here, and uh, we'll, bring the mic, we'll bring the microphone around, and I'll just answer your question right there. So are you, are you next? I don't think this cord, it goes that long. Oh, it so does. All right. I hope there's no knots. That's on you. Okay. <laughs> I lost it an hour ago. <laughs> All right. I'll take it out of your hands if you take too long. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just try. Um, <laughs> A couple of comments and questions, or maybe a question first and a comment. Um, first, on a question, and, and for you, Jane, I'm wondering if you can put question 11 back for a second. I just wanted to see a little bit more on kind of the ages, um, and it would be great to compare that with services used at some point. Sure. I think that might be pretty telling. But I somehow, I, I kind of went 11. flying. Okay. Okay, so um, just looking at kind of average ages um, in the yes voters, so, so kind of 36, 36 to 40 to 55 right in the here. big clusters. Yeah, that's your 36 to 55. It's and the blue. no voters goes out a little bit deeper. So it goes out. You still have a even strength more even in the district. early numbers, but then it goes out to a little bit higher. Right. Okay. Um, correlating that with services used at some point. In other words, taking a look at age and services together. Not now, but just as a... Well, actually, I can probably do that for you right now. Which ages do you want to look at? Um, so those... So that's question 11. Yeah, I'd say the, the, the edges, not the center, but the edges. In other words, a little bit younger, a little bit older. So you want to do your 36 to 45? Yep. And then the uh, and 56, actually, or, or maybe even, yeah, and then and 66 to 75 as well. So you want to look at just these, and then what do you want to look at? Um, ages and services used. Okay. So the next, the question 10. Question 10. Oh, wait. Bear with me. All right, so these are the respondents in those categories. So again, library is still super hot. Uh, recreation is in the same place. And then DPW. So it doesn't really change the distribution based on age. Is you do see in your no voters a slight uptick in your health and hu human and elder services department. Yep. If it's possible, I'm not here. I think we need to separate those groups. I think there's a younger group, and then there's a slightly older group. I think putting them together kind of mishmashed it to see them separately. Oh, yeah, I can do that. Hold on. So which group do you want to look at first? Uh, why don't we take the 50, 56 plus? 56 plus, Okay. So it's showing, the, it, it's showing you the results for voters in the yes, no, and the did not vote category in those age groups only that you selected. Right, on question two. Just 10. to repeat what we're doing here. Sorry. Okay. So in your older age group, you see across the board recreation drops off as the second most populous category, and you see an increase in the town clerk's office which was the fourth respondent generally. That goes up a lot, uh, a lot. There's a specific number for you. But second, for your do not voters, it's your, it's pretty much tied. That's 99 and 100. So it's different by one for the no voters. And uh, let's see, 83 
and 85. So it's about equivalent with DPW. And the library stays very strong. And the library stays very strong. Great. Okay. Thank you. And then the, um, the comment that I wanted to make, um, one of the things that I thought was very pointed, and it was your comment, Jane, this uh, kind of the one reading comment yeah. and the notion that correctly or incorrectly, there's a perception that the different departments of the town, the different activities, the towns and schools, all those groups need to be very much together in pushing this ahead if it's going to have any chance of, of success. And I think that's something that the folks in this room really have a big uh, potential impact um, on, is how to do that and how to make it clear that if this is what we want, then we all have to be singing kind of the same song. Well, your town rises and falls together. Exactly. Thank you. Barry? Actually, I was going to comment on that. Actually, it dovetails, Mark, into, into your question. So, Jane, I forget the question that it was, but um, I think it might have been um, the question about how long you've been in town, your tenure yep. in town. How long you've lived in Reading. And yep. it looked like that those folks who have been here longer skewed no. Yes. Those people who have been here for a shorter period of time skewed yes. Correct. And, and, it, and, and so what that says to me is kind of along the lines of, of, of one reading is that an interpretation could be, well, I've lived here, my kids have gone through the school, I've done my bit, you know, um, I can't afford to pay anymore. And some people, it's probably related to age, and some folks, you know, don't have the income. And they're the folks who came here and said, we moved to this town, paid over asking for our house, having two earners, you know, being able to work, work the mortgage. I came here for the great schools that you folks had 30 years ago. Now it's our turn. So it almost seems like potentially it's kind of a, I don't want to say a culture war, a war between the states, is, it, it, but, but that there are people who have expectations of the level of services and their desire to pay for them based on how long they've been here. But in reality, this town is Reading because of the folks who've lived here for a long time and made it what it was, and this town is going to continue to be Reading for the young energy and the young people coming in to build up this town. So therefore, we have to look at it holistically and say, what do we need to run the town for the services for the benefit of all. Now on the selectmen, we've done a little, a little bit of it, right? We were the third town in the Commonwealth to basically try to help out um, lower income seniors on the, on the tax bill, right? Does it go far enough? Probably not. Um, but it was an attempt to say, we're gonna take care of the most vulnerable, the people who've been here the longest, the people who have the hardest ability to pay. But yet we also have to look at the people who came here for the same reasons folks did 30 or 40 years ago. And how do we help them get to the point where their kids can graduate school get great jobs so that they can pay the senior tax relief for when it's our turn. So, you know, I, I think that that's kind of the, the, the messaging. It's not about like who's gonna get what, what piece of the pie. It's how do we fund the town to the benefit of everybody who lives here and who wants to move here, right? Because again, that's our property values. The people would support our property values, obviously the, the, the hard work that we do here, but it's also, also the people who wanna move to Reading and they wanna move to Reading because we have great schools, we have great recreation, we have public safety far, you know, unsurpassed. So I think that's part of the messaging that it's not just trying to get people who are you know, knocking heads, oh, you, you know, you're a young whippersnapper or you're an old, you know, old crony, right? How do those people get together and realize that their best interests lie in a town that's well-funded? So that, that's a, a piece that I think there's an opportunity for all of us. Well, and, and if I can add, as you were speaking, this occurred to me in, in the comments from some of the school committee members. Uh, folks that have been in town 30 or more years and their kids haven't been in school in maybe 20 years, um, the education landscape has really changed. I mean, it's just gone through such a tremendous change. And trying to communicate how those changes are, in many cases, federally mandated and, and, and state mandated, um, it's a very different world educationally than it was. And so that's part of the communication that we need to, and then the social contract that sort of exists for creating an environment that folks had 30 years ago for their kids and then to continue on just the way that you said. Other Any questions? other comments? Sorry, Peter. <laughs> yeah. um, Eric Burkhart, um, Reading resident on FinCom. Thank you very much for putting this together. I think it's terrific. Um, then again, I'm a data geek, so I love this FinCom, kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I just heard my wife groan in agreement somewhere, and she's at home. Um, 
so a couple things. I, I think the I, we might need to be a little careful about saying it's, and if I heard this correctly, it's not statistically significant. I'm, I'm not even quite sure what that means. I think statistical well, significance that gets into like you know causation and variables related and right. all that. I, I, if if we mean it's not representative or reflective of 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 the yes voters and the no voters and all that, I mean, or or you know I I, I almost don't necessarily agree with the sentiment that it's just 17 percent and we need to be careful either. I think that. To Mr. Friedman's point, I mean, we got a good chunk of the no voters, and, and overall, 17 percent is that? What I it didn't was? calculate that. Yeah, no, whatever. it was even if it's above. It's about right. Yeah, it's about even, right. if it's above five, I mean, that's above ten. Yeah. That's a really good sampling, right? Yeah. And and yes, I the, said it was about thirteen percent of the full registered voters, and yes, it okay. would be considered right. an okay sample. I, I think that's a, a terrific sample, and 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 very actionable, and. And, and yeah, you, the higher you go, the, the more the distribution is accurate. But this, yes. this, this I think, is, is really the, the respondent rate is, unless there's some kind of self-selecting thing for people who chose to take it or different than not, but I think it's a terrific sample. In terms of, in yeah. terms of a, just to respond to that really briefly, in yeah. terms of the kind of sample that we got, it really is an outstanding 24, almost 2,500 responses over the course of a little more than a month is really, really good. Um, we say it's not statistically significant because we can't scrub the data the way you know, a university might be looking at it or the way um, a polling organization may be looking at it because I'm not scrubbing it that way. And, I'm, and the questions were not all asked in kind of the right, the best right way, if you will, in terms of purity. Okay. I also tried to sure. calculate a p-value, but I, I, I ran out of time. <laughs> so <laughs> if you wanted correlation. So, so just some of the scientific approaches to designing questions and analyzing Correct. might not be there. But this the, abundance of caution. Fair enough. That's what, we're okay. that's what I'm coming from, well, an abundance that, of caution. That leads me, I think, to my, my second point, and, and a, a couple of have made it, I think. For example, you know, just reacting at face value to some of the questions, right, that the gentleman up front mm -hmm. was saying, you know, people would support a $500, but not a $750 or whatever it is. It's, it's hard to take action on that because the, the context really wasn't there or might not have been there for people. Yeah, Similarly, the, the question that I think everybody liked were where do people get their information? Mm -hmm. um, question six. I think one conclusion that might have been jumped to prematurely was that's just confirmation bias, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone's just talking to people they agree with and that's represented by talking to neighbors and social media is just an extension of that. The way I look at that is that's that's exactly what I would expect because mm -hmm. talking to your neighbors is the easiest thing to yep. do. That's the most ac accessible, and so that bar is going to be the highest. Mm -hmm. G getting your information from a, a member of the board of selectmen or the school committee or FinCom or, or whatever is going to be the lowest just because there's less opportunity for that. There are 25,000 people in the town, so how, how, you know, it's going to be much easier for somebody to get information from a neighbor uh, or on social media than talking sure. to, to Barry Berman at the PTO meeting, right? It's... Um, so, I, I, yes, there's probably confirmation bias out there, but oh, there I'm not jumping to that conclusion from this data. Well, right? confirmation bias is human nature. Fair and, enough. And yeah. I, th I think that that's to be expected. Um, and so I think, you know, you don't, we can agree to disagree on that, but um, I think that there's a lot of value in understanding how people garner information. It doesn't bad, it's just where, where meet people where they're at. To me, the question is then how's, how's it actionable, exactly. right? So, and then that leads me to my last point. I think that the real value here, I think, is being able to then figure out some of the questions like, like Mark was asking, right? So how does, how does this particular group look at that? Right, and yeah. really kind of zeroing in on how people think, really going beyond the surface of you know the five hundred dollars or whatever confirmation bias, really drilling yep. in, and then how does that inform your message, um, um, and you know, and, and uh, what what narratives can you construct from the from this data by by kind of doing that 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 level of analysis? I think there's a really rich opportunity for for what we got here to do. I that. think you're absolutely right, and. Um, if you, as you go forward and you, as the data gets released and you come up with um, further questions along those lines, please submit them because we can slice and dice that data right here just as we've been doing. Any other questions from any of the elected boards? Way in the back. Hi, Jeff. He's not elected. That's no. I'm Jeffrey Corum. Um, I guess if I could glance at question five was um, a little bit, I don't know, discouraging to me in that 
a bunch of the no voters said that the, the biggest thing that would convince them to vote for an override is if the selectmen and the school committee convinced them that the override was necessary. And to, to some extent, my, my feeling is that the selectmen and the school committee have a big job to do doing the rest of the stuff, and it's more incumbent on the people, the voters, to become informed. And I don't know to what extent the survey asked, how, many, how much time did you personally spend reading the reports, attending the meetings, reading the newspapers, um, you know, getting full information about it, as opposed to, oh, I don't want to pay any more money. You convinced me I got to pay more, right? It, that almost the question said, oh, it is this board of selectmen's responsibility to go out and personally convince every person, all 25,000 people in town, oh, you need to vote for this, right? That you've really cut everything where you possibly could. I mean, I've sat through a number of school committee, not as many board of selectmen meetings, but I've seen things that have been cut, and I'm convinced that there's a lot of cuts that we're not even going to get back with a number of these overrides. So, you know, I'm, I don't know, I, I just felt that the, how do we convince people that, you know, it's, it's not really so much the selectman's job to convince them, it's, you know, to put the information out, but how do we motivate people to, to read a little more and invest a little more in, in preserving the services that are important to their town? Jeffrey, we'll knock on doors together. Okay. <laughs> I did for, yes, for Reading, you know, last time, and, and not a lot of them, you know, people answered the doors whether they were not <laughs> home or, or not. Maybe but, I won't go with you. <laughs> um, the other thing in terms of sampling and things, I, we mentioned that the, the no voters were perhaps underrepresented in terms of the people. I think the other underrepresented would be the people that did not vote in that such a big chunk of town did not that's vote fair. at all. Yeah, that's um, fair. So I don't, I don't know what we would do with that because you know, some of them would, would, may never come out to vote for any you know, municipal election. But Yeah, many of those folks indicated they weren't in town or they didn't live here at the time. So they're sort of new people and they're in, you know, getting involved. Uh, and yeah. that you'll see in the comments. Jeff, I think just to respond to your first point, um, thinking back to the number of listening sessions that were done leading up to October of 16, and thinking about the conversation about prioritization that happened at, uh, I forget what date it was. If you asked me back then, had we done enough promotion, had we done enough explaining, I would have said absolutely yes. I, I don't see how you do more than, what was it, John, 30 listening sessions? John Halsey? 18. 18? I don't, could we have done more? Perhaps, but not many more. And yet this leads one to believe we were so far off the mark so I think, t to me, the takeaway is we've got to have a, um, a single story that's repeated more often rather than more detail. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but I think the high-level summary is what's needed. And if people have questions, raise it. We, we went into all sorts of detail in 2016, and this would say we were totally ineffective or largely ineffective at reaching people and, to use their words, convincing people. Um, we're going to have to do better. I get it. I'm guessing we're going to have to do more of a consistent message rather than doing more deep dives and various cuts of the data. Any other questions, comments? For yes. Oh, good. Are we open to the public now? Yes. Yeah. Anyone at this point of the elected boards have had their first dibs, please. Um, Amy Cole, uh, I just, to Jeffrey's point, I've said this before, but I'll just say it again. I'd love to see this go around a flyer from the town in everybody's bill of some kind. I know we got one, I think I got one twice for the senior tax relief, which was great, but I think we need that for the override. A very understandable, clear, as you said, high level information sheet that there is a vote, what it's about, what the consequences will be in either direction. Um, I also recently received a town email, and I don't think I had signed up for any list. It was about a development meeting, so maybe an email as well to residents if that's available. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from members of the public or anyone who hasn't spoken yet? We have a taker. Uh, Vanessa Alvarado, Finance Committee, Grand Street. Um, will uh, town employees and school employees be allowed to speak publicly about what the cuts will do to their departments or their particular jobs or how the 
of the potential for a failed override will affect them? Because that was one of the most powerful things that I've heard is how this affects our teachers, how this affects our employees. Yeah, during the month, first of all, police and fire have already presented um, previously to the board um, their current man, uh, staffing and their proposals for um, improvements. Um, we would expect to go through the rest of the departments in the month of December as each of them come before us and talk through the budget. Um, and I would expect the school committee to do the same uh, with, with their own their own prioritized list and, and in their own meetings. Well, the conversations happen outside of meetings because as we've just seen, community listening sessions and official town meetings are not necessarily where people are getting their information. So will they be allowed to speak more publicly in other venues? What were you thinking specifically? Videos? Uh, perhaps videos or something, yeah. I don't know. We'd have to talk to town council whether or not that's entertained in the modern era. I know 10, what was it, 2003 it was done. I don't know whether it would be entertained the I same in 17. Yeah, ethics violation. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I believe uh, the general rules say uh, from the ethics folks that a town employee may advocate, but only on their own time, under no coercion from their employer, and without using any uh, town resources. Right. So, and I believe that those conditions were all met at the Yes for Reading meeting when the, the teacher spoke. I think that was well done and well planned. Sorry. So if a public safety officer or a teacher or a DPW worker is invited to a house party in the evening um, and chooses to do that and talk to, about their job and how yes. the budget yeah. can impact them or the lack of an override might impact them, then that's okay. Is they'll that, pay them overtime, that's all. They're, they're, right, right. They, yeah. they don't come in uniform and they don't, right. yeah. so that, okay, well that's that's more than where we were last year, so. Will that be communicated to town and school or other employees? Yeah, here you go. I, I have to take exception at some of the tone here. Oh. Um, employees have had free speech all their life. The one thing that we did not do in the past that I finally reached the point of agreeing to is public safety. Part of public safety is public confidence and public trust. We did not want to upset the public by saying, oh my God, you're totally unsafe. So every year, the police and fire have presented their budget and been very transparent, but they have drawn a line in terms of comparison, uh, drawing comparisons with other communities for staffing and the voicing their own personal concerns. Um, last spring, that veil came off, so that is the exception. But otherwise, employees are always free to speak their mind um, they have done so uh, repeatedly at budget meetings. I don't know if they go out to have coffees at people's houses, but they're certainly welcome to. Um, I have no problem with, uh, and not all employees are going to share the same opinion, I might add. And that's fine. It, again, it's a free country. Um, I would say that I will still have some amount of reservation and caution on the public safety area in terms of detail. Um, you know, some things the police do are not for public consumption, quite frankly. But in terms of the general concern of the chiefs, absolutely. Thanks. To clarify, I hadn't meant that as a criticism, more just a general. Oh, okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? In front? Bill Donahue's on her way. I thought it was Carol. Who, who has a question? Jerry. Okay. Merv Griffin, Phil Donahue, Oprah Winfrey's coming next. How about Jerry Springer? I have to make sure oh, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> don't want this to wrap around anybody's uh, feet or worse. No, so um, one question I have with the one Reading comment, I think that's so important because um, although the override is about dollars and cents, I think everything we know about what motivates people, strangely enough, isn't about dollars and cents. Extrinsic motivation doesn't prove all that motivating in the workforce. Intrinsic motivation does. So how do we help people see the message and tap into the fact that this isn't just about if you don't vote for these $10, there might not be, uh, you might not be able to throw out four bags of trash. How do we get deeper than that? How do we start to heal those divisions we've been talking about with the trust gap? Because I think until we figure out that message about neighbor and community, that, you know, what are we fighting for, I guess, was the great message, wasn't it, that Winston Churchill said. So we have to figure that out. 
And we have to figure out how to tap into that for our neighbors and for ourselves, I think. Great comment. Any other comments or questions? That completes the uh, material. Oh, I'm sorry. I blocked your view. Here we have. Um, one thing about the survey that I think we need to take into consideration is uh, the sampling method is in, there's an inherent response bias. So people who feel strongly no or strongly yes mm -hmm. are going to do this. Right. Which means that there's probably a very large segment of uh, the voting population that doesn't have a strong feeling. And those are the people who probably need to be reached the most. So you may say, you look at this and you see, oh, 50% of the people are kind of here. The reality might be that 80, 90% of the people are kind of, I could go yes, I could go no. But if you're all in no, you did this survey at least once. <laughs> if you're all in yes, you found a way to do it more than once also, right? <laughs> and I think we just need to be aware of that, where the people who were kind of on the fence or voted how they felt that day but aren't really married to one of the two positions probably didn't do it. So I think that's where we need to be careful about the statistical significance around it and also how much we read into the data. Fair. Last chance. Any other questions, comments? Going once, going twice. We have a, we have a second taker. Oh. All right. There you are. I wanted to follow up on uh, Mr. Halsey's comment about the people not saying that they had used public safety. I think to some extent, I mean, you know when you called 911, <laughs> right? Um, and I haven't in the past, you know, knock on wood. Thank you. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> right? Um, but, you know, we don't realize how much we've benefited from the public safety that, you know, because the police officers pulled somebody over down there, they didn't come and do something or, you know, they're maintaining traffic, you know, that the speed limits are monitored properly or the, you know, people who come into town that are, you know, driving funny get pulled over before something happens and you have to call 911 because of the accident. Whereas people clearly know when they walk into the library, they clearly know when they have students. I was actually surprised that so many people said they had done something with town clerk because, you know, there are a couple of things I've done wearing a different hat or wearing yes for Reading hat where I have to file something with town clerk, but there's not a lot of people filing those things. So I'm a little curious as to what everybody's doing at the town clerk's office. <laughs> people vote. Is that the town clerk runs town our elections, yeah. Thing? So I think, okay. yeah. All right. Registering, Registering the, the dog okay. or paying that really late dog fee. Yes, no. Yes, Bob. Um, thank you. Um, thanks for coming, um, but to lar some large degree, um, you're the choir. Um, what we really need to understand is how do we communicate with people not in this room that didn't come to any of the meetings, but they're quite happy to go out and vote no and to answer surveys. A point was raised earlier, um, and I don't remember the numbers, I, I did them, is the yes, no, didn't votes. Um, the didn't votes are vastly underrepresented here by an order of magnitude. How do you even get people to vote? How do you get people to be interested? Um, we've kicked this idea around for 10 years. Uh, my predecessor used to say you could put a message on, tie it up in a rock, throw it through a plate grass window, and some people still wouldn't read it. I don't know how to communicate with all, all the people in this town that should be voting. And anyone's ideas on that are always most welcome. I think the, thir the thing we all learned the hard way, um, we had a tremendous amount of meetings like this last time. That's not effective. 14 years ago, there was a video produced that was very effective. Aha, there's lesson number one. Um, let's do a video. We all do it once. Millions of people can watch it hundreds of times. Um, but any other ideas on communication are certainly most welcome. And um, again, town employees have to be careful how they communicate. Um, other people don't. So the use of social media is a little bit of a gray area in the law. Um, and our employees will be very careful about using social media because a comment can be misunderstood and taken in a whole different direction. But any way that people can think of um, how to communicate with their neighbors, I'm all interested in. And to Jane's point earlier, and perhaps some of the selectmen, 
Um, anyone watching, if you have ideas, you have questions, Jane has a phenomenal ability to drill into the data. Um, once you see this in the next couple of days as data, you'll probably think of a lot of questions and other things you want to learn. And seeing the data won't be the same as Jane having the ability to combine and drill down. So please ask those questions. Um, town manager at ci.reading.ma.us is a good email. Just look up town manager on the website, you'll find it. Thank you. From the Board of Selectmen, um, we've heard Winston Churchill, I'll, I'll quote Benjamin Franklin, um, we either all hang together or we hang separately. We have to figure out how to work together as a town. Franklin was worried about his life, but in some sense, the life of the students and the life of those residents are going to be impacted one way or the other. Um, to the extent there have been perceptions in whether or not various organs in town have operated effectively, we need to make that clear and we need to speak with one voice. I do think it would be most effective if all the, all the organs of town or all the agency, all the elected boards within town actually represented the same set of facts. I know that may be harder to do, but it would be easier to have 10 people say the same thing than 10 different versions of the same thing, because I think it gets confusing. And that's part of the reason I think that people said we weren't very effective. They heard it one way one time and one way another time, and maybe distilling it down into one sheet of paper. Um, but we definitely have to figure out how to speak with one voice if we're going to act as one reading. Uh, if there are no other comments, uh, Andrew. I, just, I, I wanted to make sure that we mentioned the Yes for Reading group. Um, that hopefully will be helping all of the uh, uh, elected boards uh, s get the same facts in a digestible format to um, the, the population and get people out uh, to vote. They're, they're, uh, I think they will be a key resource for all of the different boards and committees uh, this year. So I wanted to make sure I mentioned that. Thank you. Any other closing comments? Uh, I Dan? just wanted, Bob, could you sort of review our upcoming events? We're getting into budget season. We will be talking about the override question in the early yeah. part of the year. Uh, I don't know if you have that handy, but can we review that? If anyone has a calendar, the second and third weeks of December is at the, I think it's the 12th, thir yeah, 12th, 13th, Tuesday and Wednesday. Fast. Yeah, she's awesome. <laughs> um, the 12th and 13th are the first two sets of department meetings with the selectmen. Uh, the 19th, most of the departments will have concluded by then, and the 20th is um, the enterprise funds and, our, and a discussion and a wrap up. So again, the December 12th, 13th, 19th, and 20th for the Board of Selectmen. Um, I believe all three meetings, the first three meetings will be in the selectmen's meeting room at Town Hall and the fourth one maybe. And then um, the school committee meetings you can see are predominantly in January. Um, all these meetings will be covered live on RCTV. This is on the town website, right? Yes, yes it is. Yep. This is the town This is okay. I saw the right. HTTP. Right. And does yeah. this it's get me Kim. out of Christmas shopping, all those meetings? Absolutely. No. <laughs> Amazon Prime. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. I don't have to give you one more question. Two more. Two more questions. That's, yeah, this, this, that, we, I had him shut off the other. What's. Hi. Hi. Um, we were discussed at a previous board of selection meeting having a meeting on January 30th. And you had said that you would decide by that time whether or not to put an override on the ballot and what the amount would be. So I'm surprised not to see it on that calendar. It's January 30th was the date that you had agreed the, to. The, well, the school committee will come forward with their numbers by the 19th, right? Yeah. I think she's perfect. Yeah. She's, she's, that's correct. Right. We also have the financial form on the 24th. Yeah, I think it's only January 24th. Yeah, most likely it would be end up on the 24th. I mean, the 30th, yeah, 24th. it's in that region. We need to wait until the, uh, the school committee comes forward, but um, be it the 24th of January, of January, the 30th of January, it's, it's, it's the latter. They, they have it the 24th. You might yeah, it would be the latter half of January, most likely okay. that 24th meeting. But it would not happen after the 30th. Um, I don't want to predict the future, but our intention is the minute we get the data and it's been digested, we can respond. I th and I think also we're voting on the 18th, so the data will be available in that Right. Okay. Bob, when is the town manager's budget effectively finalized? Here. That's what that says. The 24th. 24th? 
No, he's, he's received he gets it on the 19th. But when is it actually, you know, digested by you and reissued in final form? By charter, it's owed March 1st. We agree to speed it up a month. Right. So if you see that February 1st date, um, that's when I will right. present the balanced budget for all departments to FinCom. I, I purposely put that after the 24th in case there was some discussion. So, right. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Yeah. So, if that's, um, Bob, if that's what your intention is, is to present the balanced budget on that date, I don't see how we can. Yeah. No. Um, there will be a balanced budget going into the 24th. Okay. But it may change depending on how the discussion goes on the 24th. All right. So, Sorry. to Aaron's point, we may need to schedule something on the 30th. Correct. Because I, I, the 24th. All right. You know, all right. sounds like is when all the, all the, you know, the so, no, data comes in to us. Well, what I would picture is you're, you're going to have a balanced budget sooner than the schools will. Oh, yeah. We're um, the schools will vote, I would hope, a balanced budget on the 19th. We'll see. Um, on the, or on the 18th, sorry. On the 24th, the Finance Committee can weigh in as to whether they have a different opinion on the use of free cash, which they've done every year or many years, I should say. That's, to me, the only thing that would change the balanced budgets that are in front of you. So I don't think there's a whole lot of discussion. Assuming, um, if I may speak for, for John, and I know we've talked about this, we each have a list of addbacks prioritized. It shouldn't take a long discussion. Certainly, you can meet on the 30th if you need to, not that, a problem. That list of addbacks, you see that on the 24th at the financial forum? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I think it's either be the 24th or the 30th if we need to, somewhere yeah, in that. I think we should plug it in and plug in the 30th. And the reason I say that is on the 24th, we receive, you know, we're going to, there's going to be yeah, predictable discussion about the use of free cash. And that could, that could vary based on what comes out of the school committee on the 18th or 19th. Um, I guess what I'm saying is on the 24th, there's a lot of variables. And personally, because it becomes the Board of Selectmen's job to make a decision to put one, to put an override on or not, and to put, and what amount it's going to be. I would rather be able to do that with kind of a fresh start on the 30th. If we have to spend two hours talking through that three, I don't care how long it takes. Right. I'd like it to be the, the sole right. topic, like tonight. This is yeah. this is very productive when we have essentially one thing to do, and I and I just would suggest that we plug that thirtieth in. If we don't need it, it's you know it's not a bad right. thing, but if we reserve it, it gives us the opportunity to have a dedicated discussion without distraction. Yeah, the thirtieth is a Tuesday night, so it'll either be Wednesday the twenty-fourth or Tuesday the thirtieth. So that that should be enough accuracy at this point in the calendar. John? Yes. Could we get that up on the website? I'm just thinking of, you know, the trust issue, transparency. Mm -hmm. I want people, I want the public to know that we may be voting on the override on the 24th or the 30th so so uh, they can at at attend our meeting or just so they're, so it's very clear to everyone what we're doing in, in the time frame. Uh, is this not directly from the website? It is, but the 30th the the data is yeah, there. Yeah, there, there's no, okay. yeah. You know, once, it's, once it's clarified, I think it's pretty simple to add. Yeah, I don't, on this yeah. day, yep, this is what it's going to be. I, I don't think you need to do it today. No, no, I get no, no, your no, point. No. Sorry, is there another question? Yes, yes, there is. Hey, George. Yeah. Uh, George Catch and Colvin Road. I would like to suggest, <clears throat> based on the comments from everyone wanting to have more details, and also know that all the boards have gone through a vetting process in terms of the different options and the impact when you add it all together in terms of any increase in the tax rate and what the override would be. And so my suggestion would be is that at some stage in these, in these uh, deliberations that you show here is the uh, level services budget. Here is what we'll do to take public safety if we add one fireman and one policeman, and one unit of schools, whatever that unit may represent, and then two units for each of the departments, and have the different options, and then it comes up with whether it's a $500 increase on the average house, or $250, or, or whatever it is. What that would show, and here's how the different boards deliberate it, 
and that shows what the impact will be in three years, five years. Will you need another override in five years? I mean, if you have a large, I mean, the, the, the principle I believe in the last time was, let's have a large one to cover for the next, I don't know, eight or 10 years. Eight to 10. People didn't like that, okay? But if you do a lesser amount, maybe you need another override in five years. But if you lay it out, have the details, what's the impact? What will we lose? What will we lose in terms of students getting the proper education? What will we lose in terms of public safety? I mean, right now, when the chiefs presented at the meeting, they said that they get a lot of support from other towns. But sometimes, with open uh, crisis and everything else, you can't do that, maybe in the future. So look at the different options, lay it out clearly. Here's our different choices, here's the impact. We do that on one page. Here's what we lose. You heard the town manager speak about a balanced budget and then these ad backs. That's exactly the concept. You'd have an ad back on the town and an ad back on the school side. It, it's that concept. That spreadsheet has actually been built, George. The one you're talking about that shows, you know, cost per fireman, cost per, you know. It's a lot simple. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Kiss. Kiss. I love spreadsheets. Yes. Uh, Linda Phillips. Um, one thing that I haven't heard discussed tonight that I'm very interested in is that all the cards will be on the table for any override discussion because it looks like we've got some big capital projects coming down the road and that's going to impact how people feel about paying more money for more services even if they want the services because some of those capital projects we may have no choice in doing and that's going to if, if you have $500 extra in your budget to give. Anybody in the household would say, what's the priority for that? <clears throat> Spending that money. And so that's going to impact the number as well, the override number. Yeah, the financial forum um, one, that the town manager presented um, a list of additional capital items and some items in the not too distant future that would impact the capital uh, plan. I presume they'll be part of the same discussions we have in December. They'll all be clarified, restated. Yeah. And all those capital items have a life of their own and yeah. a different timeline of their own and a cost of their own. And so I agree, you need to sort of lay them all out. And some of them are going to be needed, but they might not be for five years down the road. So then you in your mind, you have to say, OK, will I not vote for the override now? Because five years from now, I might have to do this. Uh, so it's important that they know, you know, the magnitude, the timing, yeah. the decision process, yeah. so that, you know, and, 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 that, and that stuff changes all the time, too, so. I, I mean, a lot of conversations for the last override, when I was in the public meeting, was people were saying, why are you bringing up an override when we, we all agreed, you know, between themselves that Killam was the next project they wanted to spend money for. So people have to understand when we're going to spend money, why we're going to spend money, because the capital, you know, hasn't been funded fully because of the constraints we've been under. And there's going to be a breaking point when we're going to have to focus on the capital. And that's got to be taken into consideration with the other operating override for personnel. So. Thank you. As, as well as projects roll on the plan, projects roll off the debt plan. So there is a balance there. And we try to make things balanced. Any other last questions? Oh, yes, Linda. It's, it's actually not a question, just to thank you. I wanted to thank RCTV because they make these meetings and all this information available. And to highlight for those watching on TV and those not able to come here, you can watch the RCTV recordings on YouTube whenever you have a moment. So I know it's taken me days sometimes to watch whole meetings, but RCTV makes it possible to watch those and get firsthand information. So um, I just wanted to thank RCTV for doing that. I hope that the kids at the high school who have the new RCTV program get involved in getting the information out and use YouTube so you can really get the information, stop, re-listen to something you don't hear well at your leisure. So thank you. And, and all their uh, YouTube stuff is uh, HD TV quality. Uh, you won't see that on your TV at all. So it's easier to read. 
I'd also like to thank the uh, schools for making the library available. This is actually a pretty nice setting. It's pretty quiet acoustically, and uh, it seats quite a few people. I see a lot of empty seats, however. Okay. Um, if there are no other comments, I'm going to suggest we uh, accept the motion to adjourn. Wait a minute. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, let's see. There's a um, proposal to... Back here, no. <laughs> yeah, the proposal to generate a proclamation for a resident of Sanborn Place. Eloise. Uh, Eloise Love Shannon. Eve Shannon. Love Shannon. Uh, she was recognized a week ago. She's at age 104, and uh, uh, the thought is we should re recognize our, our senior citizens, and this is an individual that's well loved. Um, okay. It's a sense of the group. Absolutely. Yeah. I would move that we would uh, have a proclamation declaring a day in her honor in Reading. Do you have a day and, uh, in mind, John? Um, yes, the meeting. It's we're part of we're our still meeting. in business. It's part of our meeting. Yeah, it's the part of our meeting. Survey discussion portion of the evening has yeah. ended. Um, so, Thank you for coming. Um, Thank I you. would suggest that next Saturday be, be that day. Yes, she will be present at the Thanksgiving celebration that's hosted by the two reps. And I would suggest that we okay. declare that day in her honor and okay. present to her um, that proclamation. Okay. So I brought have... greetings from our board at her birthday party already. So will somebody be able from the board be able oh, yeah. to attend because that's yeah, when we're yeah. celebrating yeah. Thanksgiving that day. Okay. Yeah, well, we're, I'm, I'm going to be there. That's the 25th, John, right? At least no, it's the Saturday. It's the 18th, the 18th. Yeah. Okay, we have a motion to generate a proclamation for Eloise Shannon and be delivered on the 18th. Second. All those in favor? Okay. 5-0. entertain a motion to adjourn. Okay. Okay. Can I ask a question about Friday night? Are we going to trivia night or not? Uh, what's the will of the board to entertain a, a presence at uh, RCTV on Friday night for trivia night? Is it, it's at, where is it at? It's I believe it's at RCTV. Oh, I think I'm concerned about, um, given the, given the, Climate. I'm very concerned about the um, thought of open public if, if meeting law. If we don't deliberate, well, that was the thought the last time. Then, if we if we don't give opinions about town this. business, right. I guess we'll have to post it. Or, or can subject you post to posting, it? who's interested? Yeah, so you can post it. I can, if I post you tomorrow, it's fine. Let me, let me How'd you share. get over here? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. I was really mad. You just oh, walked man. through. <laughs> Town Council has suggested going forward, yeah. pardon me, Town Council has suggested going forward, if there's ever a quorum of a board at any event, that should be posted. And if, for instance, you attend to, plan to attend a public meeting that's not posted, you don't attend. Prior to the oh. Great Wilmington. So, like, the line a little stronger in the sand. So, well, like, for example, we can't attend the sand. That is, uh, frankly, we, we that's why we can't attend the last one. Well, what about, what about, like, Veterans Day? Right. Hey, that's not a public meeting, so that's different. That's an event. Right. But if it's a public meeting... Yeah, events and chance meetings are accepted, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you go to yeah. MMA... You could all go to dinner. Yeah, that doesn't have to be. Yeah. You shouldn't discuss business, but right. it's not a public meeting. So, so what are you saying about Friday? Because this seems to be a recurring theme. No, Friday is not a public meeting. It's fine. And Saturday. Okay. What's Saturday? Saturday is not a public meeting. What's the Saturday? birthday theme. All the, it's all the Thanksgiving thing. That's a dinner. It's not a public meeting. I mean, like a FinCom event, a school committee yeah, meeting. Saturday at, earlier yeah. in the day. At, uh, you know, if three of you show up at a school committee meeting, budget meeting, it's got to be posted. Any other posted meeting. Any other posted meeting. Right. Yeah. So we can okay. go to the trivia night without posting. Yes. Well, we should yes. post it anyways. Just as long as you win. Well, uh, what time will you be there? <laughs> I'm not going to the trivia. Oh, yeah, I think okay. you need to. Anyway. Who's interested in going Friday night? What time is it on? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'll, I'll say yes. Okay, and, I'll and, say yes. And then I'll, I'll contribute go. regardless. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a best effort to get there. What, right. Where is it again? So we have three yeah. studios. It's RCTV, okay. yeah. And what does it cost? Seven people or whatever? Seven it's, it's a seven six. It's, what? Seven. <laughs> it's, a, it's a six-person table. I think we need a ringer. Yeah, I gave it Hey, you're interested in going? <laughs> you're on camera. I'll pay, I'll, I'll, my treat. <laughs> no, you have better things to do on a Friday night. Uh, yeah, what are you talking about? <laughs> Come on. All right, as long as you don't rely on me to win. As far as you know, you're the three-time winner for Time What's Will Tell. What's the cost So you? Reading Trivia. Yeah. Pretty Phil, good. Yeah. Phil, you're Is listening. How much? General Trivia. I don't know. $25 a person. All right. All right. All right. I can I will handle gladly that. contribute. And, and, right. and it won't be that long if we're out in the first round, right? <laughs> <laughs> No throwing. 
it's a fundraiser. You realize we're right. broadcasting this right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. I guess we have at least three and perhaps uh, yeah. four, so that should be fine. Right. Okay. Friday at 7. All right. Uh, make a motion to adjourn. All right. Session to adjourn. Dan, Dan second. Did about the proclamation? Yes. Yeah. We, yes. we did. Word it. We voted. Uh, yes. We're going to declare a day in her honor. Ready? Okay. You know, we're going to do that <laughs> yeah. for Saturday the 18th. Okay. Caitlin, go on. So on, so on. Yeah, okay. Other appropriate. Et cetera, et cetera. So Caitlin will create a proclamation on the occasion of her 104th birthday. Because she has your signature stamps, and this is not a really completely legal document, she'll stamp it. You're all set. Sheesh. You could stop it. And we just need to deliver it. You could, but it's fine. All right. I mean, I'm happy to stop. Can't we all stop in and sign it? It's up to you. If you would like, I can do it up tomorrow morning and have it ready. We didn't adjourn yet. Yeah. The motion's on the table. Anybody you don't get signed, use the stamp. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. right. We have a motion on the floor to adjourn. It's been seconded. Also. All those in favor? You're here. We're out. Good morning. 936. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Good